probably 80% of our installs we do on the same day. And we have several crews that can complete two HVAC installs in a day, especially with our package units. But the average install from top to bottom now complete is 0.75 days. We've cut that in half. So because they're able to do double, we pay them much more. Um, and that's because they understand, like we're a high performance environment. We want you to work twice as hard so we can pay you twice as much. And they're cool with that. Uh, we just hit the heat season and my install manager came to me and said, I've got installers lining up on a waiting list to work on Sunday. Hey, what's up to the point listeners? It's your boy, Chris, host of To The Point Home Services podcast. Along with my good old friend, Chatty P. Chatty P, what's up, brother? I see you rocking the Lee's hat today. Why are you rocking a Lee's hat today on this episode? Well, because we have a very special guest. We do? Yeah, we do. Oh, and that will be Catherine. Catherine. Hey now, there. Hey there. there. <laughs> official title at least. Like, what is the title? Are you a uh, presidente? Are you a CEO? Are you I'm the CEO and Tom is the president. Okay, you see, and, and the way I view that is CEO here, Presidente here, just below that role. So Tom, how he's like, he's like, yeah, I gave her that. that <laughs> so CEO of Lee's, you guys do HVAC, plumbing, electrical, and roofing. So welcome to the roofing space. You know, Chatty P and I are also in the roofing space. Um, we'll I'll talk a little bit of that later. But welcome to the podcast. Excited to have you on. If our listeners have not. Uh, come across Catherine on any of the social you know, social media platforms or listen to her speak or heard about her from her brother because your brother always says great things about you. Quite the personality, which is which is what's drawing to you. And sometimes you don't know what the hell she's talking about. And then sometimes you're like, dear God, this girl's brilliant. So like the first time I got to uh, meet Catherine face to face was at Home Service Freedom last year when you were on the panel with my wife, Anna. And I got to hear you kind of, you know, like share some of your stories and your experience there. And that's when I was kind of like, oh, okay. Like she actually really knows a lot of, of things and is doing some good stuff. So you came, like we were just talking pre-podcast, you just accepted that role in November of last year to take over Lee's, you know, from, from your brother, Tom Howard. So you went from Orlando straight to there and just said, let's get down to business, right? Is that how that worked out? That's exactly how that worked out. <laughs> Exactly. Um, I left Orlando and then showed up here November 6th. Got it. And here's what I love. Okay. So, so on this episode, here's what you're going to hear a few things. One that Catherine gives a zero fucks. I think about what somebody thinks about her. <laughs> okay. So there's that, um, has no problem speaking, no problem speaking her mind. Um, and kind of sharing all the things and being super transparent, which by the way, I love and is great for this episode, especially with because of where you're at today. It makes all that stuff like completely okay to chat through because that's part of the story uh, and the climb, right? Mm -hmm. So so I appreciate that. But what I also want to accomplish on this in the, on this episode is getting you out of your brother's damn shadow, right? Because you earn your <laughs> own, like you do your own thing. And you're in in this short stint of time that you've been over at least running it. You guys have done some incredible stuff, including one major milestone marker that I want to put out there that I just took a screenshot of to celebrate with you. But what just happened for the first time that your brother couldn't accomplish at least? Um, in May last month, we made a million dollars in EBITDA, over a million dollars in EBITDA. And we've never crossed that threshold in one month before. Yeah, And we're on pace this month to double that. Atta girl. Atta girl. Well done. I'm excited for you. <laughs> Good job. Good job. So, hey, welcome to the podcast. Excited to have you on here. And, um, you know, you have an interesting background, a very colorful background, some might say. Um, not like Chad. Chad grew up a little bit differently, I think, than you did. Um, this is the part where I get to bust Chad's balls a little bit because he was raised with a silver spoon. <laughs> but, Chad, it's okay. But I, I, I'm going to give you a chance to rip into me. You're getting better, by the way, at coming back at me with things. It's just like, your humor is different, so it takes me a minute to catch it. Yeah, that's all right. Hey, Catherine, do you want to know what – Um, you can probably tell just by looking at Chad. He's a big hip-hop fan. That it, one of his nicknames is 22 Savage. You know, that's not the – like 21 Savage obviously being, you know, Chad's favorite rapper. But if you ever hear him rap – and he'll get to do him on the show one time. That's how he got his nickname, 22 Savage. He's pretty good at it. Can you picture it? <laughs> I can. Oh, I yeah. see full vision. Chad, Chad, you want to give us a little note? Little, little I more? do not. Okay. All right. Maybe next time. Yeah, maybe next time. We'll okay. <laughs> so, God, I love, I, use, I love, I can't tell if Chad's face is a little bit more red, but if it is, I've done my job. Um, so, let's do this right out of the gate. 
And we already talked about how you just came in to lead, uh, you know, Lee's in November of 2023. Uh, yeah, 2023. But go ahead and just share with the audience for some perspective. Now, you know, let's don't assume everybody knows who Lee's is, know who you are or your brother, right? So let's just, you know, Lee's is in Fresno, but let's go ahead and share what size is the business today? You just shared the EBITDA, you know, your EBITDA from May, which is great. But what size is the business today? Like what's your staffing and what's your staffing look like? So just tell us where's the business sitting at today so they know like what kind of leader they're listening to. Lee's right now today serves from just north of Sacramento through the South Central Valley of California with our headquarters and our main business being in Fresno, where we do do the majority of our revenue in Fresno. Um, we're on pace uh, this year to do around 70 million in revenue. That's a 48% growth rate organically year to date so far. Um, we're just about to participate in maybe some acquisitions maybe. So then that might change and won't be organic and we might be bigger than 70 million next week. I don't know. Talk to us <laughs> then. But that's what we've got going on right now. Uh, mostly heating and air. We've got plumbing. We're added, adding electrical, roofing, those different things um, there. My brother, Tom, started at this company in 2006. A lot of people don't know this. He started as a helper. Uh, sweeping the floors here. And the reason why he ended up in Fresno, this is where our dad was from. This is where we grew up. And um, we had HVAC in high school. He did at the time. So he started here in 2006, went through college, all of that. And I think he took over Lee's around 2012. I was totally not um, related to the business during any of this time. We worked for an HVAC company when we were really young. I remember somebody I babysat for, our, the first um, company we worked for, came out with like a black floppy disk and it was QuickBooks for co contractors. One of the big black floppy disks with the circle in the middle. And I was like 13 years old. He was like, can you write my, my invoices on? Do you know how to use a computer? I was like, yeah, I got it. I made $3 an hour. I worked 20 hours a week wrote my own paychecks, did that. So when Tom took this business over in 2012, um, Lee's, I think they were small around 4 million at the time, I think. All the way fast forward, the pandemic hit. I am a mother of four. My oldest is 21. My youngest is 11 today. So I was raising children. I was married in Wisconsin and I had a network marketing business. I just told you that. So my social media can get a little interesting. It's entertaining. It strategically brings people in um, on that. And uh, when the pandemic hit in California, I think that all businesses can relate with this, but California, especially uh, Tom was having trouble staffing here. It was a major staffing crisis and I was, you know, kicking rocks around. I had gone through a divorce, <laughs> doing network marketing, living my life. And I told Tom, I'll help. So I came on as a CSR. Um, I'm pretty sure Tom paid me minimum wage. And um, even though everyone else was making more, for some reason, he was like, no, that's fine for you. <laughs> with that. And uh, I learned all the processes systems here in the call center, accounting, HR, payroll, and went to Armenia and opened the 24-hour support center that we have there. During the pandemic, I did that in 2022. And Lee's continued to grow. Tom uh, works full-time with Service Titan, helping other contractors grow at the rate that he was able to help Lee's grow. And he got them all the way up to last year. I believe they did around 50 million here at least. This is what I have right now. Uh, we'll do over 70 million this year. Um, I took over in November because like a lot of other HVAC companies, 2023 was a rough year. Marketing really started ticking down. I believe that's just a reflection of inflation rising faster than our target market who are homeowners, American homeowners, their wages are not rising as fast as inflation. So we've noticed a major shift in consumer purchasing behavior, especially our consumers who are watching their bank accounts, who are watching their interest rates, who are watching their loans and their financing. And 2023 was rough when supply is down on the leads and demand is up because there's so many companies, especially in the private equity space now, trying to compete for these leads. We had to get creative. We had to strategically change our sales systems, our marketing, our operations, everything from the top to bottom um, between where I've gone from Armenia and come back. I worked in Vegas for some time and now back to California, being able to come in in November after September and October, which were Lee's worst months in company history. 
I always say Tom lost more money in September and October. You go, why me, me, me? What Lee's lost more money. But I, I'm adamant that Tom lost the most money um, in September and October 2023. HVAC in California took a hit those months. I think everyone can relate with that. And it was up to us as entrepreneurs to participate in creative thinking, to inspire our staff to be high performers and grow to the best versions of themselves and have them sign on to our vision to create in the business, a healthy organization that's going to be sustainable for 40 more years and be able to provide essential services that Americans depend on, um, like heating and air and clean water for the next 40 years. And we've been able to turn that ship around here. And I'm really proud of that. That was a hell of an intro. All right. <laughs> We're in business. How is it? Yeah. You yeah. you you were telling a story. Hang on, Chad, because I got a, I got a great segue here that I've been waiting to do. Um, and you just like put a pretty little bow on it for me, Catherine. But in all what you just said, I heard a lot of things. And by the way, I heard you drop in the Vegas stuff too. And I'm, that was the stuff with Brent and with your brother and Jerry, right? Right. Yes. Okay. Um, d different different company, not least, but um, brother's still involved with that one. But what I hear is a story of uh, resourcefulness, right? Because you got to figure shit out, especially when you're in business and you can't figure things out on the fly. Uh, and also being resilient, you know, being resilient and also being, you know, and some good leadership um, and good like mental fortitude. Now, I wonder, I wonder where maybe some of this foundational things like came from for you. Like maybe how did I learn some of these things? Um, how did I learn to kind of stick up for myself, you know, be resourceful, be resilient. And could it be, from the five felonies that you got and the time when you got locked up. <laughs> what in the hell was all that about? Like, yeah, the de prison definitely builds character. <laughs> um, definitely, for sure. Uh, build some sort of routine, things like that. You've got to be strong character. But I actually, somebody just asked me recently that we do business with that kind of learned of my history. And he was like, so... um." Do you and Tom have like uh, different dads or something? <laughs> and I was like, no. Why do you say that? Like me and Tom, we're my mother's only two children and we do have the same father as far as we know. <laughs> That's what they've been telling us. And he said, well, I don't know. Your life just seems a little different. And I said, well, you know what? That's because like you all don't know about Tom's life. Like we had the whole same life getting up to this point and it was the exact opposite of a silver spoon. And I won't go into the whole thing, but we were very, very poor. So I told Tom recently, I said, just remember that I built a million dollar business before you did. And he looked at me funny. I said, if you check my federal indictment, they said we trafficked more than a million dollars worth of cocaine. And <laughs> And he was like, you're right about that. I let him know, you know, like the taxation, the regulation, you know, it's not a profitable business. There's no value at the end. They're giving you zero X and they're taking everything. It was a terrible idea. I was very young, but I think I've always been this way that if I need something, I'm going to go out and get it. And when I was young and confused and raised in poverty, I thought, well, maybe selling drugs was the way to do it. And that was a really hard life. And, you know, going to prison is never fun. And it definitely builds a strength from inside that you've got to learn to take care of yourself. Tom went in the separate direction, right? You hear this a lot. Two kids, same parents. Tom decided to get under the water and go on a religious mission and participate in college <laughs> and all of these things, you know, and kids that came from where we came from, I think my path is actually much more common. Fortunately, I did spend my time in prison. I was like the greatest little inmate ever. I that's some strong believer that high performance. And I came out stronger, much, much stronger. And um, part of that, I think, too, is when you're in entrepreneurship, where that um, was one of my biggest strengths is that I'm not scared to fail. I'm not scared to lose everything. And I'm not scared to go head to head with someone who thinks they're right when I think I'm right. Yeah, that's great. So so um, I can see how like you could learn some of those things from by, by, being, by being locked up. How long how long were you in prison? Um, which time? No, I'm what? just kidding. It was two times, 36 months altogether. <laughs> 36 months. And and I'm assuming that was quite a while ago. 
Yeah, quite a while ago. Right. But, um, you know, and, and this is going to sound like really weird. I wasn't thinking this. As you were telling that story, though, I've thought about, you know, I, um, one of my closest friends when I was, you know, I came out of high school, he did the same thing. Like he kind of went down uh, that path and, and I and I didn't. And I um, mean, he was like locked up for nine years. So he did a lot of shit wrong. But you know what I've learned, too, about uh, anybody who's kind of been you know, selling drugs or in that business is they actually like if you just focus that same like entrepreneurial spirit and hustle and grind on something that's like legit. There's actually a lot of success there. And so I do have a friend I will mention his name um, who did do that. Like he got in trouble and he's like. I need to go do something legit. And he built a great business and he just exited from it, you know, and that's awesome to see like that. Cause you got like all the right skill set to build the thing. Like, and, and you got a hell of a lot of risk tolerance too, because that's about as risky as it gets. Cause you got like a major, you know, that's <laughs> dying. Like that's the next like shittiest thing is you're going to get locked up. So I commend you for going through all that and getting out of it. Cause that's like one small little piece of your life. And you have all this other massive chunk to go and live and do good shit. So you're using it in the right way, which I think is uh, super admirable. And, and I wanted to tell that story and I'm glad that you're open to telling that story because it is part of who you are and, but it's also part of what you're implementing is some of those skills and things that you learn about yourself and how you can, you know, lead in different situations. We brought on a guy who was a green beret a few episodes back named Scott Mann, and he was talking about leading in chaos, you know, and, and, um, you learned how to kind of, you know, grow and be, you know, um, in chaos and learn things in chaos, which would be prison. Who's a little bit. Probably, I don't know which one's scarier, going to Afghanistan and those tours or going to prison. I don't know. I mean, this, I guess it's probably Afghanistan because you die over there. You get shot and die. But you can also die in prison. Um, so, But regardless, you took these things and did good shit with them, and you're doing really exceptional with it now. And so that's what I want to jump into is when you went into um, – and by the way, Chad, you can chime in whenever you want to now after this next question. So I give you my permission. But now, when you came in in November – you know, to start running Lee's, and you've had quick success, that's not that far – that's not that far off. What is, what is, um, like, what are some of the things that you did right out of the gate to kind of come in there, set a precedence for things and start to make any adjustments? If anything, like maybe it was just, you met with the staff, but like, what did you go in and you start doing to kind of put your own stamp on things and, and to start to set it in your direction? Um, I think when you come into a, a company that's suffering, like Lee's was when I got here in November, the first thing that you have to address is the culture because your team is down. They feel like failures. You know, they feel like losers. We feel like as, as the owners, we feel like we failed, we lost what's going on. And I think by November 2023, anyone in HVAC in California was like, wow, we're experiencing major shifts and we're going to have to make some changes. So when I got here in November, the culture was very low. We had laid people off for the very first time layoffs. So by no fault of their own people who depend on us to provide them a paycheck to feed their families, we weren't able to do that. Something I take really seriously. So I think addressing the culture and announcing that there's going to be major changes was the first thing I did. I did it in the form of a company meeting. I pulled everybody in. I let them know things aren't good right now. And as a team, we're going to make it better. Um, we've had to lay people off, people that depend on us, and that's going to stop right now. Um, and that was my major focus, was dry, making sure they knew I was going to drive revenue so that we could we could pay paychecks. We were able to offer every single person who was laid off a, their job back before the first week of December. Um, so they were able to get a paycheck before Christmas. And I think that um, that focus shift with the team and taking it to why we need to drive revenue. I think a lot of owners, a lot of business owners are, are nervous or hesitant to discuss why profit is important with their teams. But once they understand that, you know, it's the profit that we need in the bank to pay your paychecks, they're a lot more welcoming of your vision and your plan. So really working to turn the culture around um, and set it in a new direction was the very first thing that, that I focused on. And it was well received. No, never, <laughs> never. To then, I mean, there's still this day you could probably cut <laughs> cut it with a knife. The people who will thank me and pray for me and love me and are grateful for the way we've changed their lives and their families' lives. And there's people who just don't see eye to eye with me. What do you see? So you know, you talked. <clears throat> in uh you know when you got there you're laying people off all of that obviously in the growth path that you're on right now you got a you got a 
you got to have people to do the work. Is it, what would you say are kind of the few key things that you guys have been doing, maybe just call it the last three months that have really just been where you've seen this like just exponential growth path? Because I don't think, I think it'd be interesting to learn because I don't think everybody's seeing that type of growth, even still where, you know, I feel like things are back a little bit. We've got this heat coming in, uh, which is good, but I don't think people are seeing that type of growth. So what, what would you attribute that to? It was the change in culture that we did before. And if you come in here today compared to what you walked in in November, it's a completely different business. People are happy to be here. People are driving towards our goals, which are increasing revenue profitably. We're having record profit percentages on top of record revenue, on top of record profit dollars. And every single person here is concerned with those numbers. Every single person here knows that they're part of something greater than themselves and that we all get rewarded handsomely on the other side of it. Um, one of our big things that we've noticed that we were able to cut costs um, in materials. So I made some major changes to our cost of materials and our negotiations and our buyings, but our percentage uh, labor as a percentage of revenue is up because we're paying more to our people to do the increased volume and we're saving the money on materials. So we're still having an increased uh, net profit percentage, even gross profit at that level percentage by paying our people more, decreasing the cost of labor. And you know, when you pay them more, they work harder. When I got here, they told me the fastest install that they could do from top to bottom was 1.5 days. It would take them a day and a half to do a complete install. And there was no way to do it faster than that. And in California, they cannot do same day installs, Catherine. That's just not possible. If I had a dollar for every time someone told me something wasn't possible that then I showed them was possible, I'd already be rich and not have to work. But they said it wasn't possible. Now we do the majority, probably 80% of our installs we do on the same day. And we have several crews that can complete two HVAC installs in a day, especially with our package units. But the average install from top to bottom now complete is 0.75 days. We've cut that in half. So because they're able to do double, we pay them much more. Um, and that's because they understand, like we're a high performance environment. We want you to work twice as hard so we can pay you twice as much. And they're cool with that. Uh, we just hit the heat season and my install manager came to me and said, I've got installers lining up on a waiting list to work on Sunday. Well, he said, what kind of world are we living in? I said, I don't know, but <laughs> we're not, we don't try to, we try to keep them off on Sundays because, um, you know, strategic partners, cranes are going to be more expensive, all of those kinds of things. And we need them to rest, but because they're making so much money, um, they just want to work. They want to work. They want to work. And I think that's a big thing with who are your employees. A lot of people are like, you know, your whole team will run through a wall for you, Catherine. How do you do that? So I'm very strategic about who I keep around. Um, if you're not on our squad, I love you. I honor you. I respect you. But if we, you know, you can't, you're not on, like, you're not, if you're not with us, you're against us. And so I have a team that understands my goals. They have the same goals. We work together as, you know, as a whole. So we're all part of something greater than ourselves, the whole team, even our HVAC installers in the field. That's awesome. And, uh, you know, hats off to you uh, for recognizing that that culture and leadership is, is ultimately what drives results. Um, one question I would have is for you and is and mainly because I get this all the time, but working with a sibling, how do you and, you know, obviously uh, you, you like to give Tom a hard time, which I, I think most 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 people do. Um, but uh, and we love Tom. But uh, how do you guys kind of split responsibilities? How do you guys kind of interact? How has that been kind of working so closely together and, and building what you're building? It's been really great because we come from two polar opposites where Tom has like more than a decade of experience over here in this industry and had his own growth pattern all the way up to God of service Titan or whatever his job is over there. Um, <laughs> with that, no, um, take that back. Take that back. We are not in the God of service Titan. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to run with that one. He's like, he's like the little leaf over the. <laughs> 
<laughs> it was, it's so funny because actually, I think you guys were there. It was when I first came back to the United States, because originally I came to the, the trades, like I'm in network marketing mode and I'm just going to help Tom set this call center up in Armenia, which I went and I did. And then Tom had no idea what I was doing over there because I'm on the other side of the world, just logging in from the computer. So I had moved to Dubai and my mom told on me that I was in Dubai, not at this job Tom had assigned me to in Armenia. So that's when he called me back to Vegas. When I came back to Vegas, I was just going to do the little call center there and then be on my way. I wanted to go to the Philippines um, and just, you know, hang out on the beach for a while. And I was going to leave. And when I was getting ready to leave um, Vegas, they asked me to take over HVAC service. And at that moment, Tom was like, oh, wow like Catherine's really going to stick around here. And so I went to the vertical track in Phoenix. If you remember, there was a VIP event out in the pumpkin fields. Do you, you recall desert. this event? It was like in the desert. It was actually, yes. yeah, it was where Rhino X, Chad, it was where Rhino X was the first year. You know what I'm talking about? The desert. You like oh, the, I'm well so aware of that. Our bus ride was just Yes, yes. Work. Okay. So you remember <laughs> I was there. Tom, this is like my first event. He's like, these are all my friends. And he's, you know, and I'm meeting everyone and I'm watching this VIP event on stage. And I think that like Chad was on stage and Tom was on stage. I don't know. I remember um, a few people were on stage and Tommy Mello had the microphone and he was like, if there's any questions for smart people, they go to Tom Howard. He's like the smartest person I know. And I remember texting my mom. Like they think Tom's so smart. Like, <laughs> wow, there's a lot of room here because I'm clearly smarter than Tom. <laughs> like, like their standard is very low, mom. I can rise up around here. So <laughs> I was texting her that from the, you know, from the table in the desert at the pumpkin patch. And um at that point in time, I decided like, I'm going to stick around and work here for some time. And we were in the auditorium in Phoenix. And I asked Tom, where are the women? There's not very many women in here, Tom. Is there a separate conference for them? And he just looked at me knowing where we come from. Uh, we were raised by a single mother who was a professional engineer, um, graduated the Purdue University. Well Yes, yes. So both of our parents graduated from Purdue and she was one of the first 30 uh, professional female engineers, uh, first 30 members of the American Society of Professional Women Engineers. Now there's hundreds of thousands of them, right? Lots of women become engineers every day. When my mom did it in Indiana, of all places, um, there weren't very many. Easy now. <laughs> Easy. Her first job as a professional engineer was in South Chicago. It was very difficult for her. We've heard all of these stories you know, as she's gone up through her life. So when I looked at Thomas and where are the women, he just looked at me and said, mm, it's pretty bad. That's all he said. I was like, oh, okay. I wonder how bad it is. And then I went on a search to find other women who have risen up and taken leadership positions in this industry. And I found that there's not a lot of them. And a lot of it is systemic. You know, it's just who was in the field, who was doing the jobs, who owned the businesses and, and, so, and so on. You know, so I thought, wow, you know, I've got a great big mouth and I'm pretty smart, much smarter than Tom. And there's all these businesses out here, like, you know, maybe I'll stick around and work. And that's when I really, really started. Um, I went to HVAC school right away in Las Vegas on nights and weekends while I was the HVAC service manager at one of the fastest growing, most profitable companies ever. Um, and I did, after I left the call center there, did the call center, I worked in HVAC service for some time and then sales. And so Tom, I'll get back to the original question, has really coached and guided me up until this point. Um, and still every single day I call him whenever I need assistance. But Tom has kind of given me the roadmap. Once I got to HVAC service and went to vertical track, he said, OK. And I stayed on through the sale at Fetch, uh, Fetch a Tech and um, went into sales. And that gave me an opportunity to, to learn HVAC sales from Brent Buckley. I got to, every time I went into a call, I got to call him 
during the call, I got to call Brett. After the call, I got coached by Brett. And so I got very quick cra crash course. Hey! <laughs> very quick crash course in the trades by going overseas and starting a business in the country where I don't speak the language, um, coming back and doing structuring and designing the call center, managing an HVAC service team, and then working underneath Brent Buckley in sales was an incredible learning experience. And then, so Tom really kind of guides me along that path from afar and then taking over lease. I probably call you what, like four times a day, quick calls, like, Hey, Tom. realistically, <laughs> <laughs> I just need time, to know it's just a BS about stuff that we're laughing about, about lease, but yeah, so, yeah so, two calls a day about business. So listeners, if you can't tell, we had a surprise <laughs> guest just hop on that surprise guest is the second best. And that is Tom Howard. Not Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> At least Tom can defend himself a little bit now. Tom, you don't even know this, but you're getting your ass kicked right now. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I, I literally, Chris sent me a link, said, hey, would you mind coming on? I said, sure. So, well, the person said, no, nah, I just let Catherine have her day, like, do her thing. Yeah. When I had space in between meetings, and Chris literally takes a picture and uh, texts it to me just now. And I, so I was like, okay, so I log on, and I, the first thing I hear out of your mouth, Catherine, is like, well, of course, I could do this better than Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Perfect. I, and that's, well, that was my big epiphany when Tommy Mello was like, Tom Howard is the smartest man in the room. I'm like, well, they don't know that I'm here, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> No one told them yet. And so I thought if that's the bar, Tom's the highest, I can clearly rise up in the industry. <laughs> I mean, come on now. So <laughs> that's where it came from, I think. And then really taking a learning perspective, I have so much that I can learn from Tom in this, you know, as we work as siblings in that way. But one thing that I get a lot, especially like here at least where people know Tom and we work, they say, they always say, you're the only one that can tell Tom that. Or like when Tom's, you're the only one that will tell Tom he's wrong or something like that, which just confuses me because I'm like, well, he's wrong. Like, wouldn't you tell him that he's wrong? No. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, I'll do it, you know, and sometimes Tom says, no, Catherine, you're wrong. And we agree to disagree because he just doesn't know that he's wrong yet. And we move forward. <laughs> that's how it works, Chad. I hey, think that's perfect. <laughs> yeah, I think it, it hurts a lot of companies when people are just afraid to speak up and say, hey, you're wrong. I think at Service Titan, when I'm working with Vahe or R or whatever, like they spend a lot of time telling the team because there's sometimes when it's Vahe and R, the founders are fighting, right? Not fighting, but like disagreeing about disagreeing, something. Right. And when I got there, like a lot of the executive team would just stop talking. And I didn't realize I wasn't paying any attention to them, but I would usually, you know, mouth off and, you know, give my opinion. Cause I, we're contractors, right? Air conditioning guys, plumbers, whatever. You're used to just saying, no, 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 this is right. That's right. Whatever. Um, and then R and Vahe had to spend a lot of time saying, Hey, look, like we need you guys. As soon as what they called mom and dad are fighting. Like that doesn't mean you get quiet. You need to like voice your own opinions. And um, I noticed that it really, the more people they got on the team that were willing to do that and push it around and, and really <clears throat> voice their concerns or whatever, the, the faster we were able to make decisions as a team and the better decisions we were able to make because you could hear all the different perspectives. And you know, when people get quiet in meetings and they're afraid to tell the boss what they think you're losing all those opportunities. Yeah. And sometimes you need a tiebreaker. Yeah. <laughs> so exactly. you tiebreakers. Yeah. Well, I think it's, I think to, to your point, Catherine, I think just having, uh, and I don't know if you would, I'm sure you would agree with this, Tom, but like having someone's perspective from outside, that's not in the grind of just, well, this is how we do it. And you're just, you're literally like, playing all the same cards that you played before. And it's like that old saying, you're not going to get any, you're not going to get a different result if you keep doing the same damn things. Um, and so it seems like that's kind of what's happened here. It's like, Hey, here's a fresh perspective. What should we do? What needs to change? And how do we make things better? I think the reciprocal of that is you've got to have <clears throat> that leader that listens to the perspective, right? So like, doesn't always have to agree, but at least listens, hears it out. And is like, you know what? Hey, you're right. Is willing to admit when they're wrong. Catherine's pretty good at that. Like she realized she's wrong all the time. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, we, we do go back and forth and, and you got to have people that are like willing to just back off. And, you know, if 
if data shows and, and service time, we have a saying, at least it was on the wall at the old building. It said, in God, we trust all others must bring data. <laughs> and like, if the data shows that you're wrong, that's fine. It's, it's okay to be wrong and admit that you're wrong and move on to the next thing instead of spending all your time to, you know, trying to prove that you're right. I think because Catherine and I are brother and sister, it, I think allows us to be a little bit more bold with each other um, and get there. I hope to be able to create an organization one day that has that kind of free speaking ability and that people understand that like, Hey, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And, and that's okay. And you can tell me, I don't think we're quite there yet. Cause a lot of people are afraid to like speak up to the boss, but I hope to get there one day. Yeah. I think too, that we all have the common goals, right? So because our goals are so big and we want growth so fast, um, that we have to make decisions quickly. So we can't be scared to be wrong. I have a lot of friends who call me and ponder on different ideas that they have for their businesses. And while you're pondering on the idea, I've implemented it or failed and retried three times over and made failed three times while you're still thinking about it. I've got so much to work off of and made so many improvements. You'll never, ever catch up with me. And that's because I was wrong three times before I was right, before you did anything. I heard so I'm not scared to be wrong. Time. But, you know, a lot of times yeah. because Tom and I, we work together, I call him, hey, what kind of direction can you give me? And he gives me this, 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 and this. And then I make a decision based off all the intel that I've collected, which is, you know, a management skill that along this journey, Tom's helped yeah. me develop. I think, I think one piece that she just said there that's hard is that, she asks me for advice and I give her like three or four things that are coming to my head on it, but then she has to make the decision. And that's a discussion we have a lot, which is Catherine, this is your call. Here's what I would do. Now there's going to be a couple of times and I, I could, I can't even think of any off the top of my head, but like where I have to say, no, 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 we can't do that. It's like, you're going to, it's, it's, it's so critical on this piece. Like we can't screw this up, but that's so rare that like most of the time it's like, Hey, I think you're wrong. I think this is a really bad idea. Here's the reasons why, but it's your call. You've got to step back as the leader and let the manager make their decision because keep in mind, it's their bonus. That's on the line. That's right. It's their equity. That's on the line too. Yep. You can't make all the decisions for them and then blame them when things don't go right, yeah. you know? And so, and there's sometimes Catherine's in a position where she's bold enough to sometimes when I tell her, this is a, I think this is a really bad idea. Here's why. And she still makes the same decision anyway, after taking my input. And sometimes she's right. Cause sometimes she just had the gut feeling and makes the call, but you got to have that GM. That's not afraid to stand by their convictions and say, Hey, you know, right is right. And I'm going to do it. I took the input. I listened to it. I was open-minded, but I still need to make this decision and pull it off. And I have a really, really good, case study. And since you're on here, you can help me because there is a story you, you were telling Chad and like all of us in our LSD peer group call about your sister making a call with one of her top, with the, with the top sales guy, guy something like five yeah. to $7 million, something like that. And like, you were scared about like, you know, some of this, like, this is a perfect example of yeah. her making a call. Right. That, and I, and I, that, we've I been our top sales guy for like five years, six years. Yeah. And so I want you to, I want Catherine, I want you to share the story because like, if you, you know, you, when you get, you think about losing your top salesperson selling that kind of money, you're like, Oh my, like you start to get anxiety and all the things happen and like, what am I going to do? But um, you know, also being uh, a toxic in a workplace is what, what kind of value you, do you put on that? Like there's, there's also a value to, you know, to having that being spread around. Like there's, so, so I want you to, to, to our, tell our listeners who've probably been in, this, in a similar situation before and, you know, or, or in it maybe now, but you know, you had to not only deal with the top sales guy, but then the, but then the second salesperson under him and trying to build up his, you know, um, self-belief and value and, you know, and what, in his, what he or she can accomplish. Like tell that story because when Tom was telling us in that, you know, that group, you know, it was like a typical Tom Howard story. It took like 30 minutes for him to tell it. <laughs> That up, but it was actually really, really good, and I remembered it. And that's whenever I was meeting, uh, I saw Tom like a few weeks ago down here, uh, here in Phoenix. I was like, dude, I want to ask your sister about this and tell, have her tell that story because I think it's important to, for the listeners to understand. One, like you go to your top sales guy selling that much, who's not making the meetings, like you know the 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 meetings, like. To me, that's disrespectful, and it shows a lack of respect for everybody else who's also saying, "Well, why did why does he get to miss it and I don't?" 
you know, there's, there's some, um, and then can, that can impact leadership, right? Like losing trust in leadership, mm-hmm. but you had to go in and, and manage that person, you know, either, uh, to, to fix it or manage them out. That happens sometimes too. But then you also had to go to the other, another one of your salesperson who's also a, a good producer and also like pep talk. I'm like, tell us that story on how that went down and what did you do to like resolve that situation to get the outcome that you did? When I initially got here, you asked me some questions earlier about what did you do first? And I pointed towards towards the culture. And one of the most important things that you can do is identify who is on your team and they need to be the high performers and the people who really matter. And the numbers don't exactly reflect that if they haven't had a high performance environment. You have to identify the high performers. So when I had come in and I wasn't received well initially, in fact, our highest performer at the time, highest performing sales person um, had quit prior to me arriving. So he had already said, Tom's bringing his sister in. She doesn't know what, whatever. I don't know what his reasons were. Actually, he didn't say them to my face. So he had quit before I got here. He wasn't up for the changes. And like I told you, one of the biggest things is you have to let them know what we're doing right now is going to change. We're going to make some changes. So we're stronger. Before you became GM, but you were in charge of revenue by that point. No, no, he quit. Remember, he quit right before I got here. He quit because someone else showed up first. And then he was like, I'm not sticking around for this change. So he left. And so he was like, he had given us two weeks and was in process of being out. And so number two salesman wanted to have a meeting with me. And it was out of genuine intentions because this individual is a high performer who I wanted on my team. And he wanted to tell me all the things that the whole company was doing wrong that had driven this number one salesperson out of our organization. And I was like, oh, gosh, here we go. Let's go hear what we're doing wrong. And so I had in mind there's like several people in this meeting not just him and this isn't a one no it was him it was him our, res- our number two residential it was our head of commercial sales at the time who we've i i let go rather quickly after that as well and our um acting gm at the time who is now our director of hr so we're having this meeting to hear what we're doing wrong and he says all of these list of things he had prepared and that is why the top salesperson left what are you going to do And I sat there and I thought about it because I'm not going to do anything about your list. I already know what we need to do, all of this stuff. And this is somebody who I wanted on my team, right? And that's where you have to identify. So many business owners look at the revenue and are like, we cannot live without that person. But you can, okay? If you have high partners, they'll rise up. Let me give one piece of context here. We lost $480,000 like two months before this. In September. Yes, they know. You, Tom, lost more money than ever in September. It was yes. our worst worst month on company record. And now right. you got this sales guy coming in. And I'm just thinking in my head, as I'm hearing this story, thinking, I can't wait till she just rips this guy's head off. Like, I just can't. I just I just want to tell, him, tell her, like, have her tell him like it is. You're the one. You're we're part of the problem. Screw you. Get out of here. But anyway. And that's what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting to hear that. But go ahead. No, but from my perspective in leadership, this is someone I want on my team. And in this situation where you're coming into a losing failure environment and you need to turn people into winners, it's your communication is critical to them. So I thought, sat and I thought about it and I looked at him confused and I said, I don't think that my brother he kept saying you need to tell your brother (laughs) i said i don't think my brother feels like he lost his top salesperson so i disregarded all of his list and all of this bullshit he was telling me about how screwed up we were and everything we needed to fix and focused on the fact that he thought we lost a top performer and we didn't and as soon as i looked at him he just looked at me i said Sir, do you remember when this happened? This is someone who's been with Lee's for 18 years now. Do you remember this? Do you remember this? Remember when you were with Tom and COVID happened and we lost all those commercials? Remember this? And he starts thinking about it. He goes, you know what, Catherine? I think you're right. That salesman was no good anyhow. (laughs) You know, and that's really where it comes. There was another sales organization, which I wasn't sure which story you were going to go to, Chris, when you went with this. When I first took over the service department in Los Vegas, I had number one service salesman. He had served, sold like 
$300,000 in August, which, okay, I understand that's great, but I needed them to be better, right? I needed to lift him up. My whole job, right, is to manage human behavior, to drive positive performance, the results that I'm looking for. And he starts going off on me in front of the whole service team when I have no HVAC experience and I'm new in this position and there's no other women doing it in Las Vegas. And he says, well, listen, lady, I'm number one around here and I'm doing pretty well. You see me, August, I was number one around here, so I don't probably need you. I'm just going to do my thing. Okay. That's what he, he said. He said that me. in front of the whole, the, the whole team. Now, I'm Chris, remember, I told you I have a network marketing organization and we sell these little packages of drinks that you mix with your water and they put you into ketosis. OK, but I sell a lot of them. So <laughs> I'm looking at him in front of the team and I said, you know what? Your skills are exceptional. You sold three hundred and fifty thousand dollars in August. But listen, sir, I personally sold more than that online in my spare time in weight loss drinks and i'm fat then you sold in air conditioning in august so excuse <laughs> me but i think there might be some room for improvement you want to know what give me 60 days he came in that night after his shift he said okay fine lady what do you got tell me what you got and i said okay let's do it and I worked very closely with him building his sales strategy. And by November in service, he sold $750,000, more than a hundred percent increase in 60 days. And I didn't even know anything about HVAC. <laughs> I had, was in school at the time. <laughs> Great story. That was fantastic. <laughs> but it's the same management principle. You have to manage high performers. And I pride myself on being a preferred leader of high performance salespeople. Yeah, I love that you said you got to manage human behavior. That is the game. And you also have to uh, understand how they receive the information to you, right? That's also important because um, you can say the same thing to, you know, different people and, you know, they take the same thing, different people take it, you know, different ways. Man, that was awesome. I, I'm Tom actually worked out that you were on here too, to be able to kind of fill in some of the gaps. Um, didn't even know about the Vegas story, but I know you have Buckley there too. But having Buckley there too is fantastic. That dude's, a, he's ridiculous. Like Brent's awesome um in a tremendous salesperson but it's a cool story to be like you know um looking at the value of the person is more than just the revenue of the person i know that's harder to digest for some people based on your position you know or your thing but it is that is how you have to look at it right and and so you saw you saw something different than tom than tom saw in that you know the real best you know salesperson and we're able to kind of turn that thing around and uh what a way to kind of like put the pin in the balloon by saying, you know, listen, we didn't lose our best salesperson because that person's thinking like, Oh, well you just flipped the script on them, you know, and, and a little bit of self-belief, you know, and probably a little bit of, of change. So I commend you for doing that. It takes a lot of, I would say balls, but not near. <laughs> so it takes a lot of nerve to be able to pull off, you know, that, that kind of move and do it, but it's, it's necessary. And look at like the short term, you know, like the, in the short term, like this, the success the business is having and then obviously where you guys are, are going to. And um, it's, you know, it's a fun story to tell, you know, it's in it like the, we're like, I think, 50 minutes into this podcast episode already. And, it, and, and it's one of those things that fly by because the stories are the fun stuff, right? Like everybody's got them in their business <clears throat> and it, it's, it's what makes it, it exciting. It's just opening up and telling like the hard stories, you know, or something that might embarrass you if you care. But like I said, right in the beginning, Tom, you weren't on here. I said, your sister gives zero fucks about like, I think what somebody thinks about her because uh, she believes so much in herself. And so um, if you haven't been able to tell by now, listeners, she's pretty wide open, right? And, uh, I love that. Like it is a colorful conversation, but it's good. Like it's not just lip service. You're actually like doing the things and, you know, and, you know, Tom has always, you know, said, you know, you know, good, you know, good things about you to to me or to us or to any of our, you know, our anybody who's in, in my friend group, and and I I see why, and I told him that, like I I got a glimpse of that at Home Service Freedom just by the way you held, like you conducted yourself. I think something I appreciate about you that frustrated me initially about you that you don't know <clears throat> is I'm saying this like live, right? This is live. Um, is that I'm not like pro women anything. I'm just pro people. Mm -hmm. And I was like, damn, dude, Catherine's like, man, I'm going to be, it's a women, women, fuck men. It's <laughs> not what it is. It was, it's, you know, and Anna's very much like I had these conversations. She's a badass leader. Like you've got to me, you're like, she's legit. 
and she doesn't care who it is. She's like, put the best person in the seat. It just so happened that previously it was a lot of men. And now it's just women are added to or capable of doing it anyway. It's just now you're putting where more women are putting themselves into positions to be those leaders and examples in the industry. And I'm for that, by the way. I'm yeah. all for that in anything. Doesn't matter. I've got three girls, one boy. Like I'm for it. <laughs> so, but when I listened to you on that panel, I started to understand more the why behind like your, you know, like where you're at. So, um, so it gave me meant to like, you know, appreciate, you know, what you're, you know, I still thought, man, she's a little bat shit crazy, but she knows her stuff. <laughs> right. We all think that. <laughs> <laughs> I embrace it. Actually, <laughs> it keeps people on their toes. It's like that Luke Combs song, beautiful, crazy. Like I, I was just at <laughs> Luke Combs concert and I'm like, man, you know, there's part of the song that really makes me think about you. <laughs> it's just like sweet there's the couch piece of shit. <laughs> so hey i gotta know okay well because we're gonna we gotta wrap this thing up in like the next like 10 months um i want to move well first off Chad, did you I, we didn't give you a chance to speak and when tom's on here nobody really has a chance to speak so um if you have anything you want to ask or can i move on to my next question you move on to your next question chris oh, i want to interrupt your flow thank you chatty p yeah. um okay so you know, we were talking about um, you, you, you. I think you were talking about maybe electric and roofing and some of the stuff being newer. But what I'm really curious about is, you know, what is what are you, where are you like you mentioned 70 million. Some people don't understand what like can't even like they don't know what that means. Like, you know, there, there's nothing to it. It's just a number. It's just, a you know, a number out there that you threw out there that to them means not. What are you trying to accomplish with this business? Like, what are you trying to do with leaves? Is there like. An end goal, like you know, you talked about wanting to go to the Philippines and just hang out there, you know, like it looks. Yeah, sweet. I'm gonna answer this one. I got this, Tom. I got this. Here. I, I want to know, well, and then I want, and hold on, and then I want Tom to <laughs> disagree with whatever he needs to disagree with, and then you guys hash it out. All right. So I know I've already talked about this before that um, you know our industry September and October were really hard. 2023 was really hard, I think, for a lot of people. And I already discussed that I I strongly believe through my research and observation in the industry that it's a change in consumer purchasing behavior. We've seen a massive increase in inflation. The wages aren't rising that fast. Their purchasing behavior is different. They're watching the interest all of those types of things. And we need to have different strategies because air, clean water, uh, clean water anywhere in this country, air conditioning in the desert or heat in Indiana is a life or death situation. And so these are restricted trades and their trades, their, their services that Americans depend on to survive the same way that they depend on the emergency room to be open when they need it, the same way that they depend on the police to answer the phone when they call, they depend on electricity, they depend on clean water, and they depend on heating and air. What we're seeing is that the people running a lot of these companies are not building sustainable businesses, okay? Forbes just put out a study that skilled labor is at all time lows. And this is something that's going to be a problem for every single American for the next 10 years, because you can't train a plumber today and have him ready next year. It takes five to 10 years for them to learn everything, right? So these are services that Americans depend on that business owners need to build businesses that are going to be healthy and sustainable, right? So we are looking at lease, we're looking at the economy, we're looking at our current strategy and operations, and we're doing the really hard work and making the shifts and the changes that we need to do to build a business that has a good profit margin to put away money in the bank to make sure we make it through whatever the American economy is going to face over the next 40 years. And we're able to provide California residents with clean water and heating and air and any other essential services that they depend on. And we want to do it better than anyone else. And that means that we need to charge for it and we need to make a profit. And we need to do that to be a healthy organization and serve the people of California. Does that mean the business owners make money? Absolutely. I felt like I actually would have seen that. And then this is, or this uh, commercial is supported by XYZ. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what 
we're doing. My whole team knows we are driving up revenue. We are growing as fast as we can. We are acquiring customers. We are converting sales. We are increasing revenue at the most profitable rates we can because that's what we have to do to provide these services to the people who depend on them for the next 40 years. And the companies that aren't doing it, they're not going to be able to provide these services and Americans will suffer. So high level, you're focused on the service, not the revenue. Of course. Because the revenue will follow the service, right? A million percent. I'm on a mission to make sure that leads is sustainable. This is a serious problem. I don't think most Americans are aware of. We run out of plumbers. We run out of clean water. People die. That's the case. And I know people complain about prices. We have very high prices. Guess what? When you go and get heart surgery, which is an essential service that you need, they charge you whatever price they want. We're not a charity. We're not obligated to be to be low priced. We live in America. It's a market economy and skilled labor is at the lowest supply that it's ever been. Yet every single American feels entitled to electricity and a roof over their head and clean water and cold air and heat when they need it. So I want to build a company that's going to last forever. And if I'm going to have consumers that support me because they need me and they depend on me. You got my vote. You got my vote. Fuck it. We're, we're good. You got it. Anything, Lord, like, President. You never hear somebody looking for an attorney. Let's say they're going into a lawsuit and they're, they're getting sued. I, I need to go shop around and find the cheapest attorney I can. No one does that. No one goes to find the cheapest doctor they can. No one, like, why? It's not even if it's your health, just attorneys. Like, you don't go try to find the cheapest person. You, your financial advisor. You don't look for the cheapest financial advisor on the block. I mean, why? Because it's important. So why do you go find the cheapest plumber? Which, by the way, if they don't, you know solder your pipes properly you're going to flood your entire house or get mold and everything else and destroy everything your kids are sick and everything else and oh you don't put the backflow preventer in properly so now people in your house are sick or whatever i mean your toilet's not flushing it like all kinds of stuff that's wrong but people want to find the cheapest one they want to go out and find the cheapest thing and Catherine's obviously figured out that like that's just not the game we're going to business play. owners are doing their community a disservice by not running a profitable business point blank period they will not sustain and those people will not have the services that they need that's gonna be a great social clip by the way right there <laughs> <laughs> go ahead and uh, make a little notch on that one whoever's <laughs> listening whoever's listening to this right now who's going to edit this for me make that one a clip nice <laughs> thanks guys that's fantastic hey, listen I, I, well, I love having you both on here i love both of your passion for the industry and like your insight i mean Catherine could literally run for political office somewhere <laughs> with that whole spiel. That was awesome. And you know what? I think that um, part of it is, you know, when somebody's listening to you is, uh, is hearing you say it or believing that you mean it, you know, it, it's, it's two different things. And, and when you say it, I, I believe you mean it. Right. And I think that you genuinely are trying to serve first. And, and by the way, I wasn't saying like, you know, uh, we don't pay attention to, or we're not worried about money. We're certainly worried about money. You have to be. I'm just saying that is the byproduct of actually you focusing on the service, right? And the people and, the, and doing those things. Like that is the byproduct of what comes with that is money. And it's filthy okay. rich. Who knew you could be a plumber and get hundreds of millions of dollars? I'm out here to tell you all you can. I mean, just meet our good friend Ishmael. That's all. <laughs> that's all the motivation that you need right there. <laughs> He'll tell you if he can do it, anybody can do it. Uh, but uh, yeah, so, but I was just saying, you know, I appreciate, you know, both you and Tom, I appreciate you hop on here. I knew that was kind of like, if you could, cool, if not great, but it, I knew it would help the story. I'm glad you hopped in right before I was able to tell a salesperson story. It was interesting, but I think both you two have a, um, you know, a real, uh, a real gift to help other people too. And a lot of experience behind it, but two different paths, like you said, you know, um, we've learned that Catherine is better than Tom. Um, I believe, and <laughs> if we, if we ask Tom, Tom is better than Catherine. <laughs> But, but, uh, Dan, your mom's got to be proud because you two have accomplished some really cool shit. And she's definitely clearly smart because she uh, is a boilermaker. So, you know, <laughs> got my, our vote there. But I appreciate Both our parents were actually, yeah, that's what she yeah. was saying. I did, I, I think you told, I knew about one. I didn't, I didn't know about both. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, they're um, both from Indiana too, Hobart and Chesterton. Just like Chad and I'm just a couple of Asian boys who, you know, built the roof and business just to, to serve the folks of central Indiana. 
<laughs> well, I'm excited to follow the journey. Your guys is, you know, uh, the, the, the new roofing edition, all that kind of stuff. Obviously we all kind of play in that, in that space a little bit. So just the story overall, but I'm curious to also to Catherine to see, you know, when I see you at, uh, are you going to go to, if you're going to go to home service freedom in San Diego, mm-hmm. I think that's, you know, we're all, I think all of us are there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'll be curious to kind of see what progress you've made, you know, in the next few months. Yeah, it's going to be an exciting next few months. This is our game time right now. Just started. Yeah. Yeah, no shit. Thank God. I was just saying in one of our group, our text threads, like I was looking at the client or the lead. The we have a basically a all full client leaderboard or lead board where I can see all installs coming in, all service calls coming in, and it certainly was nice to see a massive bump in the install leads coming through over these last few weeks. Thank mm-hmm. God. Well, you're right. Time to make hay. That's all right. right. Any parting last parting words from you, Chad? Or are you just gonna go and work on your next hip hop song? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, it, Hats off to you both. Uh, Catherine, it was great talking to you. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head with the culture piece and and making sure that in your company, you've got that right. Um, Because if you can't get anybody to buy into your vision, um, you're going to struggle to build something really special. So um, again, hats off and uh, awesome stuff. Yeah. And I'll go ahead and finish with uh, uh, how proper he said hats off with his leaves. There it is. Representative, but listen, like to our listeners, you know, all this stuff too. It's, you know, um, Catherine didn't go and get some college education and learn like, no, she just learned real life stuff. Tom went and traveled all over the damn world and learned different shit, two completely different paths. So you're listening right now. Maybe you had the bootstrap business together. Maybe you just got a GED. It doesn't matter. Like it's, I would argue and say it's definitely more about the mental toughness, price, mental fortitude of just, you know, thinking about it, but then actually doing the things, you know, and how you get there, you can end up at the same place on multiple different paths, but just fucking do something, right? Don't be afraid to try and do things and change it and do whatever and, and ask all the questions and ask for help and, and don't be afraid to get information from your employees, even if it differs from what you believe is to be correct, as long as they come to you respectfully and with solutions and, and some reasoning behind why you think you're doing X, Y, Z wrong. And and you may have listened to Catherine talking about, hey, I could give it, I don't care what that list says because it wasn't about the things on the list. He was missing the point as a salesperson of what his value really is. Those things on the list were nitpicking shit that he didn't, didn't, didn't need to be paying attention to anyhow. He was forgetting the main thing and that's he's 100% capable of doing the job as soon as he changed his brain a little bit and the way he thought about himself and what he could do in the business. And that happens often, by the way, I think that you guys probably experienced a lot of that stuff. And especially if you're in any form of leadership, those are things that you're dealing with constantly is trying to pay attention to the human being and where are they at, how do they envision them, how they view themselves and, and are they passionate about what they're doing? Like you can change the mindset game. It's not an easy fix, you know, but you, there's certainly a lot of ways you can do that. Sometimes it's just around getting the right, getting around the right people, you know, and figuring out what to do. But there's a, there's, there's, if nothing else, you need to just sit and maybe work on yourself a little bit. That's okay too. I think we've all kind of went through that in different phases on like, I got, I got to get out of this, you know, this funk and like, and refocus. And that's okay too. I think we go through that in different phases of business and different trials and shit like 2023 would certainly challenge somebody, you know, on, on, am I capable of continuing to do this or not? But you got a lot of options. And I think that, um, I know Tom has, you know, always made himself super accessible, you know, to people to be helpful. And I appreciate that. And, and Catherine, um, I'm not sure if you're comfortable with sharing or whatever, but where can somebody connect with you if they want to be able to ask you questions or lean on you or anything like that? Um, Catherine Howard at leesair.com or on Facebook or Instagram. I'm Catherine Elizabeth. Please follow Catherine on Facebook for entertainment value. You will really thank me for that. Um, and I promise you, you listen to this like she knows her shit. So please, please do that. But I appreciate you guys so much. Chatty P, I always appreciate you chiming in. Well played on the Lee's hat. To our listeners, you know, got to do everything, but you got to do something. No zero days. All right.